featured speaker today is Paul Hochsteiger. Sir, please go ahead. Welcome to the CETA webinar on climate change as it affects the dredging community. I'm very pleased to guide you through this presentation. My presentation is primarily based on a position paper of CETA that was published last year in May 2012. But I would like to state that during my presentation, I will bring forward very much broader topics as well. First of all, I would like to introduce the members of our working group that have contributed to this position paper. It's a very nice team of experts uh, representing the dredging industry, uh, consultants, and also water authorities. They are mainly from four European countries, uh, Belgium, the UK, Denmark, and the Netherlands. And you will see that many examples I will present are from these countries. Uh, the content of my presentation is as follows. First, I will mention the objectives and scope of this uh, presentation. Then I will go into the consequences of climate change and discuss possible implications for the dredging community. And then we will uh, give a number of examples on adaptation measures for three different types of environments, open coast, seaports, access channels, estuaries, and inland waters. And I will finalize with some key messages. Coming to the objective, the first objective is to raise awareness of the dredging community and affect the dredging community. That is you, my, my audience, uh, everybody who is involved in uh, activities related to dredging, not only the dredging industry, but also uh, consultants, uh, regulators, stakeholders. And uh, the second objective is to help the dredging community to be prepared for climate change and to understand how dredging can contribute to adaptation measures. I would like to stress that two aspects are outside the scope of this presentation. In the first place, we wouldn't get to get involved too much in the climate change debate on the causes of climate change, and we would like to focus on adaptation to the consequences of climate change. And in the second place, we will not discuss uh, measures to reduce the, the, the greenhouse gas emission of the dredging sector itself, to say to reduce the, the carbon footprint, so like, like, for example, using other uh, fuels. These aspects are outside the scope of this, this presentation. This graph from the IPCC uh, report uh, from last week uh, shows the tremendous increase of CO2 emissions from last uh, century. And these are all CO2 emissions from uh, human sources. And uh, the IPCC is very clear about the human contribution. They state that it's extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming since the mid 20th century. And the increase of greenhouse gases has accelerated uh, global warming and hence uh, sea level rise. And on the left hand side, you see the, uh, the observed uh, combined land and ocean surface temperature. And it shows a, cl a, steer, a clear increase uh, in the last period. Uh, the estimates of IPCC for sea level rise are higher than in 2007. And we here see a range from about 0.3 meters until nearly one meter up to 2,100. And these ranges are from different climate change scenarios. Uh, these figures are the global mean sea level rise, meaning that uh, sea level rise is, is not uh, uniform and outcome may be different uh, in uh, other locations. So on site specific conditions, uh, these, global, these sea level rises may be different worldwide. So my statement is that uh, climate change is, is a fact. Also, uh, uncertainties about the rate and the magnitude of consequences remain. Two trends are very clear. In the first place, a trend for a steady rise in global temperature and associated sea level rise, and in the second place, 
the increase in frequency of extreme events like storms, floods, and droughts. Uh, and let's review the, the consequences of climate change. So in the first place, um, higher sea levels, uh, stronger waves, tides, and storm surges. And then we also have uh, changes in, in, in precipitation and changes in uh, river discharges causing floods and, and droughts and also changes in erosion sedimentation patterns also cause, causing maybe damage to, to coastal areas. Coming to uh, the coastal areas and uh, low-lying deltas, these areas already face pressures from socioeconomic development, like the increase in population, changes in land use, and sometimes also subsidence. And these aspects make these areas more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. There's also environmental concern. Uh, there is a risk of, uh, of damage to ecosystem due to the increasing vulnerability with uh, changes in temperature, precipitation, and, and salinity. And another aspect is the increasing risk of uh, the remobilization of contaminants due to the erosion of older contaminated sediments. And very important is the availability of uh, enough fresh water for human consumption and agriculture that may also be jeopardized to climate change. Let us just summarize uh, the likely consequences for Europe. So climate change could mean more frequent and severe storms, the, the increase in the frequency of flooding, higher precipitation intensity, and more extreme drought, droughts, uh, and fewer days with frost and snow cover, also changes in flora and fauna, and the sea level rise something between half a meter and one meter until 2100. An example for a delta under pressure is uh, the Netherlands, which is already partly below sea level. And on this scheme, you see a number of, of pressures that we uh, expect during the next century. Sea level rise, increased coastal erosion, more extreme storms at the coast, salt intrusion, and inland more intense rainfall and more extreme river discharges. And this comes with already existing pressures from spatial developments and land subsidence. So what could these climate change impacts mean for the dredging community? In the first place, we expect uh, changes in morphology due to changes in condition, which, which means changes in sediment supply, currents, waves, tidal ranges. And these are normal natural uh, phenomena, but climate change is accelerating this process. So this means changes in dredging volumes and also the locations of dredging will change, as well as the requirements. Uh, dredging methodologies may change as well. After an uh, extreme event, reactive dredging is necessary, and uh, while proactive dredging may be more appropriate for long-term events. Let's give us some examples from, for example, the change in, in dredging volumes and, and locations. Uh, when in an estuary uh, the water levels are, are rising, uh, tidal waves can propagate further inland, uh, transporting more sediments inland. So this could mean more maintenance dredging uh, in the port. For example, here we have the, the estuary of the River Elbe in Germany and the port of Hamburg. Another example is the need for uh, specific equipment for new types of operations, like, for example, the dredging for the foundation of uh, windmills and also the burial of cables from this wind farm uh, ashore. Also, changes in dredging requirements can be expected. Uh, let's take the example of the, the Arctic ice cap that shows a clear uh, shrinkage in summer and it's getting thinner as well. And this gives the opportunity of opening up new shipping lanes in the north, both on the eastern and on the, on the western side. Uh, if dredging is necessary in these areas, this means harsh and uh, isolated conditions. 
and dredging will be done in a very pristine and, and vulnerable environment. So let us make it clear that uh, climate change and adaptation to climate change uh, does not always mean more dredging. Uh, yes, if, for example, uh, flood protection requires more beach nourishment, but no, if higher water levels mean that less uh, dredging is, uh, is needed for, for navigation, or when erosion of coastlines is that severe that stretching methods, methods are no longer uh, adequate. There are also implications for the strategies. Uh, and one very important point is uh, flexibility. Flexibility is needed because of the uncertainty and consequences, not only looking at the technology, but also looking at the regulatory context. So the regulatory regimes should uh, be able to accommodate uh, flexible approaches. And then we need an adaptive management. That means uh, a step-by-step -step approach uh, taking into account uh, the events that take place. And uh, decision-making should be based on, on sound monitoring. And because of the conditions change, we need new and innovative solutions that uh, are climate-proof. And with climate-proof, we mean that uh, these uh, design criteria, they are in, uh, in compliance with, with possible uh, changes and uncertainties during the lifetime of the project. Adaptation measures are absolutely necessary to overcome uh, the challenges of, of climate change, and they are meant to, to help society prepare for and to adapt to the consequences of climate change, meaning the increase of resilience and the decrease of uh, vulnerability. And uh, adaptation measures should be sustainable, meaning that all relevant aspects should be taken into account, just, such as safety against flooding, safety of navigation, environmental protection and improvement, uh, costs and societal interest. At the short term, it, this means uh, the collection of data and monitoring to understand the system and to do proper risk assessment. And on the long term, to uh, design adaptation measures and to realize them, taking into account that they should be flexible due to a number of uncertainties in the future. And it's very important to realize that dredging is a necessary tool for adaptation measures. Now I would like to discuss a number of adaptation measures for uh, three types of environments that are, of course, interconnected, like open coasts, seaports, access channels, estuaries, and inland waters. Coming to open coast, then we see that uh, climate change is already manifesting itself in the form of, of sea level rise and, uh, and storm surges and uh, changes in tides and waves and currents with an increased risk of, of coastal erosion and breaching of dikes and dunes. For this, we expect that we need more sand to strengthen the dikes and the dunes and that we need more sand for uh, beach nourishment. Take, for example, the, the Danish West Coast. Here, each year, year, we need about 3 million cubic meters for beach nourishment at an erosion rate of 3 meters a year. If sea level rise will go up to half a meter or one meter up to the year 2100, uh, the required nourishment is expected to increase with 20 to 40 percent from sea level rise. But we also have changes in uh, literal drift, uh, transport sediment, uh, transport of sediment alongside the coast, and this causes us another 10% more nourishment. The Dutch coast is also maintained by beach nourishment. At this moment, the volumes are about 12 million cubic meters a year, but it is expected that in the near future we need at least 20 million cubic meters a year. And at this moment, the costs are already 50 million euros a year, and this will increase as well, of course. This means an enormous increase in sand supply and sources further away. This means excavation by dredging uh, in deeper areas, uh, causing complexity, 
complexity, not only for logistics, but also looking at the ecology and the morpho and morphology. An example of an extreme event was the, the erosion of a, a stretch of the, the, on the Belgian coast due to a heavy storm. And uh, this beach had to be rehabilitated by beach nourishment and reclamation on the coastal foundation. Uh, multifunctionality is a very important asset looking at these uh, adaptation measures. And a very nice example is the amateur beach park in, in Copenhagen. First, these beaches were very muddy, and they had to be rehabilitated in combination with flood protection measures, uh, with engineered nature in the forms of lagoons. Uh, this resulted in very nice, high-quality uh, beaches for recreation. So this is a combination of, of recreation, nature, and flood protection. Another example from Denmark is the Kurge Bay Beach Park. And here uh, we have rehabilitation with a combination of, of coastal and uh, lagoon rehabilitation, marinas, and uh, dikes as well. Uh, coming to building with nature, uh, this is a very important uh, principle to, take, uh, to make use of the natural processes, for example, for the distribution of sand. And an, an example of such a project is the so-called sand engine, a uh, mega nourishment of about 2 million cubic meters that was put off the Dutch coast. And this is also a multifunctional approach where we like to combine uh, safety against flooding with uh, nature development and recreation. Uh, this means a defensive approach by minimizing uh, the environmental impact to a proactive approach by utilizing the full potential of the area. And here you see the, the present shape of the so-called sand engine, and it is expected that in a period of 20 years it will develop into a very nice uh, natural coastal defense with much less uh, maintenance uh, than when we have to catch each, each year. The second category is the category of the seaports and access channels. Um, seaports are very vulnerable because they are situated in areas with uh, sea level rise and increased storm intensity. And they are also situated at the mouth of, river, of rivers with the risk for, for flooding. But it's very alarming to see that only few seaports are preparing for the impacts of climate change. Higher sea level mean requirements for a better protection of the port against flooding and adjustment of the fixed structures like uh, key walls or uh, of flood protection structures. And what we see is changes in sedimentation and erosion in, in harbors and channels and also the alignment access channel due to changes in morphology and hydrodynamics. So for this, we need to change our maintenance strategy. Maybe the operational windows uh, are reduced and flexibility is needed to, to guarantee year-round accessibility of the port. In this example, we see the access channel to the port of Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Coming to estuaries, they face an increased sedimentation in sheltered areas and increased erosion in exposed areas and also changes in sedimentation of river sediments. All these aspects mean changes in maintenance stretching. Take, for example, the, the Humber estuary in the UK. Each year, about 5 to 10 million cubic meters have to be dredged here, but these sediments have to stay within the estuary to prevent erosion. On the other hand, we have sea level rise, and flood protection is done by my managed retreat of, of sea defenses. And this creates opportunities for the deposition of these sediments. And this, in turn, gives opportunities for the improvement of, of water quality by dilution of contaminants. For inland waters, climate change is projected to cause more extreme river discharges with implications for uh, navigation. For example, with low water levels, we might need to do more dredging to accommodate navigation. 
uh, we might to reclaim sediments from, uh, from reservoirs in order to retain storage capacity. And after extreme rainfall, clean up dredging may be necessary. And also, we have to deal with the risk of erosion of uh, contaminated sediments. Another aspect in inland waters is the, the flood management of, of river system. And in this example, flood management is done by deepening of the river use in, in the Netherlands in combination with the extraction of minerals, like sand and gravel. For the Rhine branches in the Netherlands, we have the so-called Room for the River program, where the river discharge is increased by making space for water uh, and lowering uh, the flood levels. There are two aims. In the first place, a safer uh, river area by 2015 and safety for 2 to 4 million inhabitants. And another added value is the enhancement of spatial quality to, to improve the landscape and have possibilities for recreation and nature, etc. There are a number of uh, possibilities, uh, possible measures to increase the flood conveyance of the river. For example, deepening the riverbed or uh, uh, relocating uh, the dikes further inland or uh, creating uh, side channels. I will now show one example. That's the example of the, the project of, of Nijmegen, a city along the river Waal, a branch of, of the Rhine. This is a very well-known uh, bottleneck for, for flood levels. And uh, in this case, the dike is relocated further inland, about 400 meters. And this creates the possibility of digging in a nice uh, secondary channel, which creates opportunity for, for housing, uh, recreation, uh, nature development. And very important, it lowers the flood levels with uh, something like 40 centimeters. At this moment, uh, dredging of this secondary channel is in full progress. You see here a suction dredger, and uh, about 4 to 5 million cubic meters of, of sand have to be excavated here. Uh, these will all be, will be used beneficially. Now we'll come to the, to the key, messages, key messages. I have mentioned a number of examples where climate change means more opportunities for the dredging community. But we have seen that there are challenges as well. It's very important to notice that dredging is a very important tool to realize these adaptation measures. Uh, and it's important that the uncertainties in the consequences of climate change should not be an excuse not to take action. The threatening community should be prepared to act and to promote integrated solutions and contribute to the realization of adaptation measures. So climate change measures should be based on a well-informed, adaptive, and integrated approach. And uh, for these, innovation and flexibility are crucial factors, not only for technical solutions, but also looking at regulations. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. I would like to acknowledge to the, to the members of the, the Climate Change uh, CEDA Working Group, and now we come to, to questions and answers. I will have a look to see what's all in my box on questions and answers. Uh, Yeah, I have seen some nice questions here. The first one is, uh, is it possible to quantify the changes in dredging volumes due to climate change for a certain area? So is it possible to quantify? Um, yeah, this is very difficult to make a, a reliable estimate for the change in, in dredging volumes due to the many factors involved and also uncertainties. Uh, we have developed uh, models to, to estimate changes in sedimentation and erosion for, for river systems. 
uh, due to uh, a number of measures. But for climate change, uh, I think only scenarios are possible. So we can only give uh, a number of scenarios, uh, but no real quantification. The second question is, uh, that's also a nice one, how to deal with increasing vulnerability for ecosystems with regard to dredging requirements? Yes, indeed, uh, this may be a challenge uh, due to increasing vulnerability of ecosystems. This, this might lead to, to stricter regulations for, for dredging in this specific area. That, that, is, uh, that is indeed a, a challenge. Uh, a third question is uh, flood risk measures, such, such as bypasses, may provoke more sedimentation in the main channel, which may create problems for navigation. How to deal with these problems? Yes, I, I recognize this, uh, this is a very good point, and uh, this is what we experience in the Dutch rivers as well. But, it, uh, yeah, of course, uh, during the planning phase, you should try to, to optimize your design to, to reduce morphological effects. But, uh, yeah, there will always be some remaining effects on, uh, on sedimentation. And uh, the, your dredging strategy uh, needs to be based on an integrated approach of all aspects that uh, influence uh, sedimentation. And, of course, uh, also here innovation is, is uh, possible to use uh, uh, smart dredging methods that, that reduce the, the hindrance for, for shipping. Um, yes, another question coming. How should the dredging industry be prepared for climate change? Yes, that is a nice question. That, uh, yes, uh, I think these are a number of elements that I have dealt with today. In the first place, uh, awareness. It's very important to be aware that climate change uh, is coming. And then just follow the strategies I've, I've mentioned. That means uh, follow a flexible approach, uh, and also uh, an ad adaptive approach, uh, step by step, and look for opportunities for, for innovation, for example, or for specific demands, or, or try to anticipate on, uh, on changes in, in, in dredging volumes or, or locations, or, or even... Uh, uh, changes in regulation. Let me see. Do we have more questions? Uh, no. So these, these were all, all the, the questions I've, I've seen. Thank you very much for your attention, and, uh, and have a nice day.